Welcome to a community built of tomorrow's business leaders. Hey guys, I'm William Freitas and this is the Socius Podcast. Socius, welcome back to another episode. Today we've got Luke Rickardson. Luke, welcome to the show. Thanks, Will. Good to be here, mate. Thank you. So a little bit about Luke, um, you know, I guess a professional athletic career, I guess, as an NRL player for the City Roosters for many years. Give us a little bit of a brief background and then tell us what you're up to today. Sure. Um, yes, long time ago now, yeah. hence the grey hairs. But um, yeah, look, I uh, grew up in the eastern suburbs of Sydney and um, uh, sort of found rugby through school was yeah. my thing. My, my dad played um, professional sport or back in the day for the Roosters um, through the 60s. So I had an element of uh, rugby or rugby league or contact sport in the family. So that was something that, um, you know, was in building me a little bit. And then, um, you know, I'd finished uh, uh, school and I got like a scholarship to go and play for the Roosters, played rugby at school and then got this uh, scholarship. It was um, $2,500 sign-on, <laughs> uh, second year $5,000 sign-on, um, but it was going to the Australian College of Phys Ed and study sports science. So back then they were thinking a little bit about, um, you know, obviously education and trying to sort of improve you and um, if it all didn't work out. So uh, fortunately that first year I, I, I played first grade in my first year coming out for the Roosters and um, I gave away the, the, the scholarship side of things and uh, concentrated on football direct. Yeah. Um, yeah, and the rest was history. I was, I was fortunate enough that um, I think the game changed really well for me. I was... Uh, pretty athletic and I used to like running and um, so the game went through those mid-90s where it became a very um, instead of being a bash and barge style of football it became quite an athletic game mm. um, which suited me down to the ground and I moved into the back row as an outside back moved to the back row and then had a career as a um, as a back row in rugby league which was uh, yeah as I said it was pretty athletic back in the day and that sort of suited me and I got a I got a long career out of it and was happy to win a comp and play for New South Wales and Australia so um that's it in a nutshell, really. Well, yeah, I think um, I think the background, kind of everyone everyone really knows how successful you were too. You know, being a big Roosters fan myself, um, you know, grew up watching you. So I think it was awesome to be a part of that, and and interesting to see the transition. You're right, you know, so that big boys getting bashed versus you know getting a little bit quicker, and and it's still getting quicker in today's day and age. Um, but tell us a little bit about what you're doing now. You're yeah. obviously starting in insurance, or you have been for yeah, months so. Time. That's another interesting topic, obviously, post-sport. Um, yeah. I retired relatively early at 32 years of age. So um, you have your, your schooling moment or university or education part, then you'll go and um, you'll always sort of upgrade your life, hopefully, through periods of education and work. And But with sport, you retire at 32, which is really young to be... Such a young age. Uh, ...entering um, like a whole different stage of life because I think... The hardest thing being a professional sportsman is the older you get, the more involved you are in the football team. Mm -hmm. It's not like you're sort of getting to the back and dialing it down and then trying to do something else and prepare for it. You know, I was captain of the club the last few years I was there and so my attention was full-time on sports. So finished, retired, um, and uh, I did what every young bloke wants to do. I, I, I pitched in bought a hotel, the Forresters Hotel on Favau and Riley Street with a bunch of mates and – uh, did that for a few years and um, probably wasn't the best thing to be doing uh, for me. Um, and um, what was that experience like? Look, it was good. I mean, I I was um, I ended up running the hotel, which was fun. It was good to actually do that, but you know, long hours and um, a lot to take in. And I still had that mentality of mateships and friends. And I used to host people at the pub a lot. And it's mm. a lot of late nights. <laughs> um, unfortunately, I, I met my now wife during that period and. Um, I kind of realised that it was time to grow up a little bit and yeah. go get a real job. And yeah. uh, so we sold the hotel, which worked out really well. And then um, um, a good mate of mine, David Gingell, who was on the board at the time at um, the Roosters but was uh, heading up Channel 9, uh, I spoke to him. I said, mate, I need a job. So I ended up working in sales for uh, uh, for Channel 9 for, for about five years, um, which was great. I mean, it was me sitting at a desk with a bunch of 20-something-year-old people and um, nine-to-five job. And yeah. it really taught me about the discipline of coming into work and, um, you know, in sales and doing sales stuff, which I really enjoyed. So that was part of yeah. the, the transition for me. I really realised I really enjoyed sales. 
Um, and then I ran into Paul Hines, who you know, we both worked at GSA there, and uh, he grabbed me and said, Matt, what are you doing? Are you enjoying it? Went through the whole process. Well, I'm not really enjoying it. He said, well, come and, come and fall into this insurance web, which we've all done, and um, and I really enjoyed that. Pack Sales was a whole different product, but it was yeah. a big, bigger and better product because um, – you know, insurance was something everyone needs and not necessarily, um, you know, pushing advertising or pushing another product, it was something that everyone generally buys and, um, you know, you, you could you could hopefully get thanked at the end of it because it was a better experience in selling a product that's necessary. And so I enjoyed that side of things and the insurance uh, uh, broking space and then I've gone from working at GSA to now starting my own business, which... Yeah. Um, like you did, I took a leap of faith and decided yeah. to go out there and do it. I consulted you a couple of times and said, mate, <laughs> what do you think? Um, and look, it's at the time um, I didn't think it was a brave move, but I look back now and I think it is a little bit, yeah. you know, you, it's the unknown and you're going to well, something. There's always some courage when you're opening your own business, right? And and I think we'll dive into that because yeah. I want to know, you know, where it is that your, I guess, professional background impacted um, you know your business now, but let, let's take it a, a step back because obviously a lot of the listeners will be uh, all of our audience really is, is small business owners, small to medium business owners, but also there is some professionals who are looking or listening to this conversation and one relating to at some point being you know semi professional athletes or having an ambition to grow and they might be looking to open their own business. So definitely the business discussion is going to be important. But but I know when I went through school, a lot of my mates dedicated their life to sport right and as you kind of rightfully pointed out and it's, it's been awesome to see you pivot your sporting career to the business world but I, th- I see it as a really big challenge you know as you sort of said you you retire at 32 mate i'm 31 32 now like <laughs> imagine retiring now and starting something afresh so there's a skill set in that in itself like what is the game doing um you know how, I presume that's a conversation for a, a lot of the key clubs really in mm. terms of, you know, what they're doing for their youth and because I think the message out there needs to be that, sure, you can focus on the game but there needs to be some element of thinking about what you're going to do next. I think it's improved dramatically and I know um, unfortunately been on the board of the Roosters for 12 years now and um, the NRL particularly and I'm sure the other codes have done the same thing, they've seen that that's a huge gap within that whole building block of organisation and so welfare is a big part so when Miles back playing there's never a welfare officer or someone to talk to and you know I think the great thing about the game now is that you know young men and women have got an opportunity at your sporting club to sit down and have a conversation not everyone feels great every day and you know mental health I, I didn't even know it existed back when I played it was like I'm sure yeah. there was guys I played with that had all sorts of issues but it was about getting back up and getting on with it and that's how we how we dealt with it so you know at our club, and I'm sure most clubs are doing the same thing. There's a, there's a, you know, someone you can talk to always. Um, we've got welfare officers, um, and career's a big part of it. And the junior kids have to do some type of educational courses, and it's part and parcel of the whole curriculum of being an NRL player. Um, the hard thing is the shift went into first grade. You become a first grade full time player, and I know how much they get paid these days. Not that I'm <laughs> jealous, but um, bastards. Um, but they're pretty well paid, and I think um, you know them sitting in a in a classroom at this stage in the in the in the mid to late twenties is pretty difficult to get get them to do that. But um, you know, it's about managing money now. I think a lot of them are getting to a point now where they've got reasonably good advisors, and now they're all talking about property and and what to do with uh, with their money. But you know, there's a couple of really smarter kids coming through. Luke Keery, you know, he's, mm-hmm. he's one kid that I'll, I'll, I'll refer to. He's just finished a business degree and, you know, he's got, um, you know, his thoughts on running his own financial services business at some stage, which, um, you know, he's come to a couple of the roosters. I'm sure he'll get a couple of leg ups and opportunity through that. And that's one thing I, you know, if I could tell anyone during the sporting um, field, if, you know, you, you have a good career and you do the right thing and you come out reasonably clean skinned through that process and succeed, then, you um, I think people will support you in any business venture or opportunity and want to spend time with you. So um, that's helped me in my retirement um, mm-hmm. from rugby league is starting a business and then getting support through people that um, kind of want to spend time with me, really. Mate, absolutely. And I think there's more to, there's more to, I guess, 
you know, previous NRL players being successful in business. It's not just a network thing, right? There's got to be an element of the ticker that you drive or or the structure or the discipline that you build in, in playing professionally, right? Well, what do you think are the elements that sort of put, I guess, professional sports people uh, at the forefront of a successful business career? Yeah, I, I think it's – I'd employ a sports person straight away. I think um, – a, it's discipline. There's no doubt. Um, you know, if you know, you're, you're so structured in your lifestyle. And I, it's funny. I just come off a Christmas break, and I couldn't wait to get back into my structure again. Mm. I just needed to get up in the morning at sort of you know five forty-five, and and I feel like I think better and I operate better. I like to sit at a desk as well. I don't like to do things on the run. I like to be at a desk and sit down. So structural things that you learn through being a sports person. I think the biggest thing for me, um, and it would be different in other sports. Because I was always part of a team, um, I've got this element of team. I've always had that. You know, it's about um, it's about helping other people and success through. You know, and I'm building a team at the moment, and I think my uh, um, my communication with people is is pretty open because I want them to succeed as much as I. Because if we both do it together, we'll we'll win. Absolutely. Um, individual sports people, I'm not quite sure how they sort of uh, yeah. You know, think about that in business, but I know for me, it's about communication, people, and relationships. It's all about relationships. And I think one thing I did really well at the Roosters for that period, um, you know, whether you're a 19 year old kid from the back of wherever, um, or you're a bloke who played um, locally around Bondi Beach, so the thing I'd always be very inclusive of of the team, and I was really good at uh, bringing the cultural group together. And so I think I'll. And hopefully my clientele will feel that as well. I think that's another part of it. So yeah. I'll have to give them as much as I'll give my own staff and, and people. So, um, yeah, I think that's a skill that I think I learned. A lot of, a lot of team, team people, I think, learn that skill really well. Oh, I think, you know, when you're looking at high-performing teams too, you know, no doubt, you know, building the structure of a team within a business, it's very similar to building, you know, 13 guys on a, on a sporting field, right? Um, you know, some, you've got to have a captain, you've got to have leaders within the the group and you've got to have people who are there just to, you know, take it up one hit at a time and, and then the backs can finish it off. And I think that's the frustration being in the corporate space when you see leaders within your corporate space that are really selfish. Mm. <laughs> and I go, really? You know, I mean, we're all here for an outcome and, you know, if you start looking after your own backyard but you're running a team and I, I identify that really quickly within in some corporate um, areas I think the best people um, that run teams or CEOs or in charge of business are those that understand people and give them the leeway I mean it'd be tough and hard and we always want to succeed but um, just really good communicators and good with people I think mm. they're the best people I like spending time with anyway I find that so interesting actually because you know, you and I both had some experience in, you know, what you could call somewhat corporate mm. or, or sort of middle, uh, I guess, market corporate career. And um, you do get, I guess, exposure to some individual, I guess, components where people focus on their individual career. Um, but you made a good point there that I, I really, I view business success as very much like working towards a premiership as a team. You know, if you're one team in behind you, not only the people within your business but your, your clients are of the same, uh, I guess, opinion and the same, uh, they're driving towards the same goal, then you're going to win that premiership, aren't you? No uh, doubt. I mean, and you've got a responsibility to um, to come in the office and be upbeat. Yeah. Yeah, positive and um, you, wanna, you can't drag the rest of the team down with your own yeah. issues and problems sort of thing. So you've got be positive and you know and um you know it's another thing i was talking to a guy about the other day and i sort of said look i'm at a point now where i'm going to put more staff on and i've got all these aspirations and things going on a million miles an hour it's like he said well you've had that experience of you know what's in front of you now right you know what's going to happen and um you know successful teams don't just sort of stand and wait for it to happen you're going to make those things happen you're going to go yeah. and train for it and prepare for it and you know put things in place because you know we get 10 rounds in um and if you haven't put all these things in place, you're just not going to succeed. So I yeah. um, feel like at the first room of the business at the moment, I feel like we're um, we're going well, but I really want to make sure that we, um, we're prepared for what happens this year. Because mm. we're in the service business, right, at the end of the day. I mean, at the end of the day, I'm building a business because 
you know, I want to make sure my clients get service, but also, you know, things like claims management. There's things that could really go wrong in your business that you need to make sure that spot on um, and I'm preparing for that. And that's what I'm, what I'm doing. And mm. if I didn't do that, I'd be caught short. And that's the experience of probably being a team player, right? Yeah, yeah. exactly. Yeah. And so what would you say is, I guess, one or two elements of the best advice you've received over your playing career that has really stuck with you? Because obviously you've been coached by some great coaches. Yeah. Um, now, is there one thing or another that sticks out more than others that you carry with yourself today? Um, yeah, I've had several different coaches and different approaches to everything. But I think the one thing um, that you sort of can't go wrong with is just the preparation. Um, you know, you just can't fool anyone in that space. And I reckon, you know, the high quality football teams I played in, um, the more I prepared um physically and mentally harder um in those in those teams and um and you know when you're underdone you know when you're not fit or you know you're carrying an injury all those sorts of things um but you've got to just be pre- preparations everything really you know the day i mean and it's and business is exactly the same if you're not prepared um and you don't have answers or you don't have um people that can take the ball and run with it and you know and, and help you out through that process then you're look silly and you and you and you, and you look and you won't win right yeah the exactly day. now i was talking about coaching i guess give us a little bit of an insight have you did you ever think about coaching did you give it a shot or um, was it straight into business not really it was funny with me i i sort of um i sort of had that you know i've been playing football since i've been six and you know it was a big part of my life i just want to have a break from sport but you know i think Certainly, there's a lot I could have given back, and I reckon there's. Um, You're still quite involved, though, right? Still involved, but um, but I think uh, yeah, the coaching sort of didn't yell out to me too much. It wasn't those things where I wanted to um, put myself. There's actually one funny moment where um, Brad Fittler was coach of the Roosters at that period of time. He took over halfway through the season and completed the season, and then got the gig for the next year. Didn't work out really well for Freddie at the end because. <laughs> Freddie wasn't the most intense character. He was. Um, he wanted to give him a lot of free time and play this really di- bit bit hippieish Freddie in a lot yeah, of ways. Yeah, he had a different mentality about his coaching. This could be pretty intense, but he wasn't. Um, and this particular game, I forget what it was, and I texted him. I said, "Mate, the defense was pretty poor. Like, what's happening here?" With uh, and he said, "Well, mate, you do it." I said, "What do you mean?" He said, "I don't know. We'll come in Tuesday and just tell me what you just said to me to to the team." I was like. Oh, okay. So <laughs> here I am. I've been working at Channel Nine in a suit, and Willie Mason was at the at the, oh, in yeah. the squad, which I I knew, and uh, Marco Mealy, and there was my bunch of forwards looking at me, and I'm on a blackboard going, "This is what I told Freddie yesterday," and, and I was ranting and raving, and I, they were looking at me half sniggering, and I'm thinking, "What am I doing?" And Freddie left the room. He just said, "Well, you coach them for for this particular." Ended up winning that weekend, I must admit. But um, must have been your advice. Must have been my advice. But <laughs> yeah, I just uh, I remember walking away from that saying, "No, nah, I just uh, it's not for me." This coaching caper. Yeah, interesting. I mean, look, I asked the question interestingly, just because obviously building high performance teams, there needs to be a good coach, right? And I think subconsciously, you know, how you will lead your people, you know, you will take the experiences that you had over the years into what you're doing now. Um, but tell us a little bit about what you're doing now. So obviously we're in the same game, but uh, you know, yep. tell us tell us exactly what it is that Ricketts and Insurance is doing. Yeah, so um, so I left an old company and then had about 12 months hiatus and just was looking to work in all different types of industries and wasn't quite sure. Once again, I almost retired again, so I'm probably t- double retired. <laughs> um and I was lucky enough to run into Ian Carr, who runs Insurance Advisor Net, and with another guy that wanted me to work for him. And um, we had lunch. I left. Ian Carr rings me and says, mate, come and see me. I think you should just run your own business. Um, I can sort of see in that today's meeting that you probably don't want to work for this particular guy. And I said, mate, you're 100% mm-hmm. right. Tell me more about what's happening. So um, so then I, I, I do it. I, I literally took a month and said, I'm going to just run my own business see where I end up with this thing. Um, I then rang um, my financial advisors and said, I need to do a whiteboard session. I need to go get out there and plan. And, blah, blah, blah. and then I think, no, I don't. You know, I'm employed, um, a girl works with me now, Mel Clark. She came from another large brokerage and she just wanted an opportunity to start up business and just see how we go. Mm. So I started a business with no real business plan. 
I got in there, I knew that revenue was the key to this whole thing. I was like, if I don't have a, a revenue, we don't have a business. So we got together and gelled straight away, which was fantastic. It was It was a bit of luck, I think, a lot of ways. Um, and so we're a mid-tier sort of brokerage. We went out there and um, we wrote a bit of everything. So um, some properties, some financial lines and a lot of friends supported me, but another couple of businesses from my old um shop rang me just because they weren't getting the same sort of advice or they wanted to see what we could offer and so i built 12 months um a really good book yeah to start off um and then i had a break over the uh summer and i've come back and know exactly who we are now now i am doing the whiteboard sessions because i actually feel as though that i'm 12 months in i know the ability of the business i know what we can achieve i know the numbers we need to get to so now I can create it where I didn't originally. Yeah. I didn't think yeah. there was a platform or there was a there was a, just a blank piece of paper. And um, so I'm more excited now than I was when I first started yeah. because I know exactly what style of business we can run. It's, it's mid-tier. I like, I like the idea of that mid-tier style of business. Yeah. Um, I think a lot of corporates out there have got themselves out there with large brokerages that are just not getting the same attention. Mm-hmm. And we're business owners, right? So at the end of the day, you can ring me at any stage. I'm going to give you 100% attention. You're not going to get your third account manager because mm. the turnover is so large in those other brokerages and get frustrated. We're going to get the uh, principles. And, service, yeah. yeah, so I, I just feel that I can. Um, we can really do a really good job there. And once again, the relationship is part of what we do is also with our markets. And like the, um, I've set them a lot of agencies and insurers that won't really want to work with us for a fresh new, brand new business. Uh, they want to build a book of business with me as much as I want to build it with them. So, mm. um, yep. So I think uh, just to, just to recap on that as well, yeah. I think. Interestingly, what some people might hear is, you know, there was no business plan. You know, you just jump straight into it. Um, you know, but when you really think about it and you dissect it, no doubt you were prepared. You know, you spent 12 months thinking about what it is that you were going to do, what it is that you wanted to do, what value you were going to provide in whatever situation that might be. Um, you know, I, I align that to, to football. You know, I align that to rugby in the sense that you were prepared. You know, you made sure that you, you, know, you may not have done the whiteboard session um, but you were ready. Most yeah, definitely. I mean, I mean, the thing with this, I've been in the industry for that period of time, so I actually knew what it was that we needed to do, mm. um, but I just couldn't be set on the number or couldn't sit on the structural part of things. The structural part of things I want to see in the office together, and, this, and we, we spoke about business every day, um, and we created something, right? So we had mm. 12 months of creating an absolute um you know, great little business at the moment. I'm very happy where it sits and I know exactly where we can take it. So yeah. um, tell us a little bit about what's on the agenda. Like where are you taking it and, and how are you relating it potentially to, I guess, your professional yeah. sport? So um, so it's a big year. So we're sort of second year in. Um, I, as I said, I'm putting on a couple of extra staff um, just to bolster us up a little bit more. I think we need a bit more... Um, more advisory in a lot of ways, mm. particularly claims in these areas that get a bit technical and I want to make sure we're doing the right thing by our clients there. Um, and I'm just out in market a bit more. You know, I think last year I sat back and didn't ask the questions with particular people or pushed. And now I know exactly what, what we can do and I'm confident that we can actually provide a better service mm. or hopefully a better price or premium if that's what it is you're after. I think we can do a really good job. So mm. I'm just really confident what we can do. Um, yep. I'm out in marketplace um, and I'll be speaking to a lot of a lot of clients and, mm. and, and, and see if we can win their business. And, and, and let's have a chat because obviously um, in the last 12 months, you know, you and I have stayed really close um, in terms of how it is that we could impact your business and, and help. And um, I think a lot of people listening um, – they would view competition or the same occupation yeah. as direct competition. And, you know, we're, we're under the Insurance Advisor Net banner, so it's a little bit different in that sense. But um, we definitely don't view each other as competition. We, we definitely collaborate. Um, tell us a little bit about that and, and, you know, how can you relate that to sport in any way? Well, that was a really unique part of the business that I got into. So... Um, I don't know if you've spoken much about Ian Carr who runs Insurance Advisor now, but he's a pretty incredible guy in a lot of ways. I mean, he's got this no dickhead policy, but we all got this no dickhead policy, but he seems to have got a genuine no dickhead policy. And um, he's created this business that we collaborate. If you're part of this network, then you can pick the phone up to anyone within this network and ask her questions and you'll get a very direct straight answer. Um, And that's the model he's created. And I just think, 
back to culture, I think culturally this whole system works and um, so that's been a pleasure to be part of uh, this network um, and I sat next to you for a period of time and, and, and there's some very high-end professional wordings that can get a bit tricky, right? And you assisted us in that early part, which is fantastic and brutally honest about markets and pricing and stuff. And um, so I suppose looking back on, you know, the footy career, um, yeah, it's aligning with those culturally minded people. And, um, you know, we probably did that a lot of times when we got an origin camp and things like that, you know, you'd, we, we, we found that, you know, the Newcastle Night Lads, for example, like they were very much aligned the same way, feet on the ground, soul of the earth, trained hard and worked hard. And that's what we were roosters at that period of time. We sort of feet on the ground but trained and worked hard and we got to camp together then um, we became really close because we'd push each other at training and um, bash each other up at training but then perform really well on the, on the weekend. So I mm. um, suppose a little bit of IA in that in a way that mm. we're all the same and I, and I think the other good thing about IA is well, it's success, right? And everyone comes out of corporate, does their own business and couldn't be happy having a conversation with another um, rep saying, look, our business has now grown to X or I've now won that really nice big chunky account. Like I'm, I'm generally happy for them. Yeah. And, that's, and that's the difference because our business can get a bit catty and uh, it can be, yeah. a bit strange. But yeah. tell, tell us a little bit about what it's like or give us an insight into what it's like to play representative footy. You know, Obviously, you played at the highest level. We're not just talking the Roosters. We're talking the New South Wales Blues. We're talking the Kangaroos, Australia. Um, what's it like dealing with pressure? What's it like representing at the highest level? Yeah, it's another thing. I, I, I was lucky enough in um, to make New South Wales in 1999. I think it was my first origin camp and um, – I come in late, there was an injury and, you know, I just I wasn't prepared for it. We played up at Lang Park and all the dramas goes on with Queensland up there and it took me a few years to play that uh, in that arena to get, to get confident in that arena. Um, I wish when I first broke in I had a, a, like I won't call it a mentor, but someone to just really sit you down and just say, right, you belong here and let's – you know, bring the best out of you. I think I was a bit of a passenger for those first few years, just being happy to be there. Mm-hmm. Um, so it's it was, it's about being confident within that within that within that squad. And we we're lucky enough in two thousand and three to go on a kangaroo tour, and um, a lot of roosters and a lot of um, sort of senior guys went away with a bunch of kids from Penrith who won the grand final that year, and and we just um, we pushed them, you know, and we we're confident enough to get there and train hard and play hard and. Um, we won that series 3-0 and it was just a, such a – it was about working hard and mm. I was old enough, mature enough to um, uh, to prepare really well for all those games. Um, but if it was five years earlier, I may have been a little bit not confident enough in my ability. And, um, and you think mentorship would have really made a difference? Absolutely. So yeah. It's interesting, you know, because even if we relate that back to business um, and the model, the network that we are in um, – mentorship is a plenty and you know I, I think it's a huge component to business success being you know having an effective mentor to help you get to success so who are the, some of the people or, or the mentors or do you have mentors that you I have of, yeah funny so I was just having conversations with about it before so um I kind of sat down beginning of this year and thought about the business and then David Gingell who yeah. um I was running channel, not a really good mate of mine, and I said, um, "Mate, this is what I've got, you know. This is this is business, and I've got you know employee. I'm looking. Uh, what do you think?" And yeah, he just he just set me straight about what I should be thinking more about, and um, have a plan. And I sort of now I've got a absolute clear as daylight plan, um, and I've expressed it a little bit within my staff as well about what we're thinking and. So we're now focused from the same path. I know exactly where I need to get to and someone that's experienced enough. And and not only that, because I don't think all mentors um, are great, I think someone that gets you as well. I think you've got to find a mentor or someone in business that you've got to have a relationship or, or relate to somehow. If I sat down with a leader of a business that my personality is so different to, I think mm-hmm. I'd sort of say, well, there's a few good points, but I'm not really quite sure. At least David and I, have, I've known him for, for years and we have similar personalities and he knows how I think and I had he thinks and mm. he just went, mate, this is how you 
you'll approach it and do well. And I said, mate, you're bang on. You've got me in one. I get it. Yeah. And, um, Does he keep you accountable by any chance? Haven't done any of that stuff um, yet, but I'll be, I'll be, I'll be tapping back in yeah. soon enough and saying, well, this is what I've just implemented. You know, thank you for steering me the right direction. And yeah, um, it's, it's something that I've, you know, regularly considered and you know i think something that our listeners should should think about mm. um you know recently well, not recently probably a couple of years ago um read the book think and grow rich and they sort of talk about the value of mentorship um but also a fantastic way to look at it is building like an advisory board you know i think you rightfully said finding a mentor that gets you understands you you know having similarities and personalities um they're going to help you drive forward, but and every mentor will have some play part to play, I guess, in your life. But having someone there to keep you accountable, and be like, mate, you said you would do this. Where are you at? You know, how can we get you there? Um, I think that's super valuable. Uh, I think when you bring it back to sport, when it was professional sport, particularly, if you didn't perform, there was someone keeping you accountable. I doubt. Yeah. And I think if people take that into their business world and build some accountability not only for their team but for themselves as business owners i think that's the hardest part right so, you become a business owner who's going to keep you accountable but if you build that structure it is a successful yeah i i love that advisory sort of um board or people that you can trust and i mean you know you're relatively young and it's about um you know a lot of people have been successful and failed in business mm. and to get the essence of what that is and what works for them and similar to where, mm. where you're at i think it's invaluable right to sit mm. down with someone and say you know here's this business i'm starting up what do you think my end game is and how am i doing it? you know and, and just put you in the right direction and then off you go um for me to be sitting here still scratching my head about that little whiteboard session i said i should have done 12 months ago I'd just be so, f and then explaining it to my staff, explaining it to my clients about where I'm at and who are, who are who we are as a business would be really clunky. Whereas now yeah. I'm going, well, I know exactly where we are, where I need to go, and you know, I want these people to come on the journey with me. And and so talking about, I guess, advisory boards, um, you know, share with us what you can share with us, I guess. But I guess one of the, I guess, respected boards in the NRL would be the Sydney Roosters. Um, you know, there are some great operators in there. Everyone really respects Nick Politis. Um, you know, it'd be great if you can give us a bit of an insight into how that board is run, what sort of structures you think make that board successful, you know, because ultimately the board and the club is a successful club, you know, and I'm sure I'm a little biased because I'm a rooster. Good man. But, um, you know, we're a successful club. So what, what do you think are the characteristics of that board or a board that make it successful yeah so sport boards are crazy right it's a it's a it's a it bl yeah it blows me away i mean look the, the thing is we're just very fortunate we get a pe person like nick politis mm. there's a lot said about nick but nick you know runs a billion dollar empire and car and property he's got all sorts of different things going on but his dedication is the roosters football club which is crazy um, it's the reason why he's got a tattoo on his arm. Correct. Um, but at the end of the day, I mean, sporting clubs basically leak money. I mean, it's just a really crazy setup within Australian sport that they just, um, when we get propped up by our leagues clubs, I mean, poker machines, you know, I mean, it's been mm. well documented. That's what pays for local sport and 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 rugby league's been found, founded on the basis of that. So there was a period of time when I'd go into board meetings and, you know, we, and it's, it's well documented. Some clubs lose up to seven or eight million dollars a year, and your lease club funds your football club. Just sitting in these board meetings with very smart, intelligent people, just trying to find ways to try and nullify that type of leakage, right? And make sure that you know you run a successful club, but you know your finances. I mean, you can't, you, you couldn't keep affording that type of loss. Thank you, bucket. So um, the NRL, it used to be the clubs versus the NRL, still is a little bit, and Nick. Loves the fight and a competition on that. So we fought very hard over those years to try and bring that back a little bit and the funding's come back. Um, and I've been at a point where I've seen Nick create something pretty special um, and it's a complete dictatorship, which I think <laughs> I think a lot of boards, sporting boards probably should be, right? You don't want people sitting on the board disagreeing 
the chairman and, and, and having other opinions or having their own agendas or back to that selfishness of what they should and shouldn't be doing. We just know the direction's very clear within Nick. Um, you know, we've, we've recently um, provided a centre of excellence within the new stadium. So not, another really good foresight to Nick. So we, we were there sort of four years ago and saying, well, we're going to build a new stadium, right? Allianz is going to get knocked down, going to build a new stadium. So with the SCG Trust, they said, well, we want you to be your first partner within this, within this rebuild, but it's going to take time. What are you going to do? He said, well, we probably have to go to the SCG. We said, well, we can align with the SCG, but it's not really a football ground. It's an AFL ground, cricket ground. Um, but we're going to probably lose, um, you know, memberships, you know, ticket sales. The whole thing's going to be a disaster for us. But Nick knew it was the right thing and played to to do, sign the agreement. Um, we won premierships under that tenure being there at the, uh, at the, the cricket ground. Very difficult place to watch rugby league. Mm. Tough on sales. We took a bit of a loss, but now we're in a brand new stadium. It's the home of the Sydney Roosters. Um, and we've taken branding, bragging rights to probably one of the best stadiums in Australia, Australasia. Mm. So that was foresight. We could have kicked and screamed and said, no, we'll go out somewhere else and we're not going to sign an agreement. But he supported it and it's been a really good relationship and that was something that I looked back and went, he knew it was going to work out for the right way. And we um, and you and I were talking about, I guess, what that means for junior footy as well, um, you know, off air. You know, the the quality of the facilities that the Roosters Incredible. have with Incredible. that stadium is second to none. Well, and negotiating a centre of excellence, which is which lies within the walls of Allianz Stadium, um, you know, you walk through and there's like a polished um, floor and, you, you know, there's roosters and emblems everywhere and you've got meeting rooms that um, you'd imagine Man United might have over in Old Trafford. Like it's pretty impressive and, um, you know, it's a legacy left there for, for years to come and, you know, our recruitment happens there. Our, um, you know, we are the roosters and we want to be professional. We want to be the best in the game and hence the – Facilities have got to be the same and stand up. And Nick's driven that for the last five years and as of today we've got it. So, You know, it's interesting because, you know, sure, there, there are plenty of jokes thrown around amongst mates for, you know, the salary cap and, <laughs> you know, the, the quality of plays that we get. But I think there's a huge part that gets unsaid. Um, the quality of the club in general, the facilities, the structure, the people, it adds so much to... I guess the attraction for any quality footballer, any junior footballer, but any also senior footballer who wants to experience a premium club, right? Well, we're lucky the fact that we've got through that period that we're going to be there and thereabouts, right? So if you're kind of a, a young kid and, you know, I mean, I look back and think about all that career stuff and all the monies and all the changes and whatever. I mean, I remember 2002 as my greatest moment. I won a grand final, right? Mm. Tick. Um, so if I'm a kid out there fluffing around, trying to get an extra 100000 or an extra 10000 or changing clubs, you know, I'd sort of sit back and go, well, go and pick a club like the Roosters who are going to give you every opportunity to be there that last well, first weekend of November, oh, October, I should say. So it's kind of that's where you want to be and that's what you want to play for. And what that also gives you, it gives you rep opportunities and gives you a lot. So um, we're in a position now where you walk through those doors, you've got Trent Robinson who will who, who'll believe in you and give you coaching and teach you to be a better player and a better man as well. I mean, Trent's big about, you know, you've got to be a better person to be a better, better sports person. Um, so all that's wrapped up in one um, monies will be there and thereabouts, but you get that opportunity. I mean, yeah. Brandon Smith's a good example. He's come over from Melbourne Storm. You know, he's living down Bondo Beach. Mm. I saw him on the weekend down there at North Bondo Surf Club doing the flags with a bunch of young kids, um, living a dream. And he's in a professional club that is going to give him everything he needs to succeed. And, you know, he keeps himself healthy and the team does. I mean, but there's no reason why we can't be there at the end. See, uh, I love that example because you can relate that to business so clearly. You know, anyone listening, um, you know, what is it that you're doing in your business to create an environment where it attracts top quality staff, right, or, or, totally. or, or team? Absolutely. Because, um, you know, we, we talk about it on the podcast quite a bit. Uh, the difference between a practice and a business. Mm -hmm. um, you know, a practice is very much centered around one person doing all the work, whereas 
a business is building a team where they're you know working towards one objective and and together building um, a legacy almost totally. and and I very much view you know sporting much like business world and and that example with the roosters um, you know creating what they've created is, is a great example of how people can take that into their business world absolutely now they're doing a damn good job Luke it's been an absolute pleasure to have you on the thank show you, mate. Thank yeah. you for coming on. Um, if anyone wants to reach out, how can they find you? Uh, Luke at ricketsoninsurance.com.au. <laughs> uh, you'll find me there or right, jump on LinkedIn. Huh? Yep. It's pretty easy to find people through that process, but uh, happy to help. And um, if we all can't do the job, I can. <laughs> <laughs> Perfect. Thank you for coming. Thanks, on mate. Appreciate, mate. It. Appreciate it. Good on you. Socius, thank you for joining us today. Please hit the subscribe button if you've enjoyed this episode. And if you'd like to be part of the Socius community, follow us on Instagram, Facebook, and LinkedIn to stay in touch. Cheers.